If you have a copy of God's Word, if you'll turn to Psalm 51, the 51st Psalm, starting in verse 5. We'll be reading through verse 12. As we continue to get our hearts ready and get focused on hearing uh, from Brother Joe and from God here in a couple of weeks, as we anticipate revival and renewal and a reawakening in our hearts in our church, looking at David's cry out to God, as God did an absolute wonder in his life. Verse 5, Psalm 51 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you shall teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly come before you. We ask, Lord, that you would speak to us now through your word. Lord, may you move in our hearts and our minds. May we be open and receptive to hear what you have to say. I pray, God, that you would help us to be renewed in our passion and in our love for you and in our obedience. I pray, God, that you would get us into a place to move us into a position to where we hear what you have to say, and that we freely and willingly yield to all that you have asked of us. Pray, God, that you would do this, Lord, both in Christians and helping us to live our lives for you, but also in those who have not committed their lives to your lordship. I pray, God, that if anyone in this sanctuary has never turned away from their sin and themselves and given their lives to you by faith, I pray, God, that you would help them to see that they desperately need you and also see the beauty of your love and your willingness to forgive. I pray, God, that you would help us to hear from you. And help us, Lord, to respond in obedience. It is in your sweet son's name that we pray. Amen. I was the youth pastor at First Baptist Savoy. And we had a young man who started to attend our youth group. His name was John Anthony Clark. I didn't know his name was John. He presented himself to me as Tony. As Tony came to our group and as he got more and more involved and uh, was at church every time the doors opened. He was at church on Wednesday nights. He was at church on Sunday mornings. He was at church on Sunday nights. Any event that we had... Tony was going to be there. As I got to know Tony, I discovered that Tony had come from a broken home. Um, in the process of, of just getting to know him and his family, his mother, uh, come to find out, was a drug addict. And she had done some things and spent time in jail. And his brother also was a drug addict, and he had just graduated, or would have just graduated. He actually was a, was a dropout of high school. And Tony had a lot of shame from where his family had been. Apparently, he had been a perfect kid in the last area that they'd lived in, and another place in Texas. And that's why he came and to start a new community. He didn't want to be known as John. He wanted to be known as Tony. His whole family called him John. Everybody that knew him in the past called him John, but he wanted to be called Tony. One day in Sunday school, we were talking about God's grace, talking about how beautiful God's grace is, that he loves us and wants to forgive us. And as we were sitting there, uh, just the high school kids uh, up in our little room in our youth building, uh, meeting together, Tony began to weep. <laughs> 
He did it silently. He did it where he didn't want anybody to see. He was sitting kind of behind some other kids, and he just started crying. And one of the other kids kind of turned to him and said, Tony, are you okay? What's wrong? And he expressed his desire, his absolute brokenness in wanting to be with Jesus. He had a lot of shame, a lot of guilt, not only from what he had done, but his family. And he carried that burden around with him wherever he went. And he wanted to be clean. And so the kids and I just simply shared with him how he could know Jesus. And so after we had shared the gospel and briefed with him, I, I, I never like to pray a prayer and let somebody just repeat after me. Especially in a, you know, in a kid that, that just shows real desire, but I wanted to make sure he understood what he was saying and what he was doing. And so I said, Tony, you know, I know that we're in a Sunday school, and I know there's a bunch of kids around. And if you want, we can go off and talk, just me and you. But it's really important that you pray what's on your heart. That you really mean what you say and that you understand what you're doing. He said, I'll pray. I don't mind praying. I'll pray. So I said, okay, Tony, I want you to pray what's on your heart. And then I'm going to pray for you. And he prayed a simple, beautiful prayer of giving his life to Christ and thanking him for saving him. It was an amazing experience. And Tony left just a few months later. His mother actually had to leave the state because she had written some bad checks and had to get out of town. So Tony left the youth group, but he left as a follower of Christ, as one who had been forgiven and cleaned. And the amazing thing is that I'm able to be friends with him on Facebook. Tony is in the Marines. He has uh, married a sweetheart, and he is doing really, really good, not following back the, the same path that he had been shown but living a different life as one who has been born again. God offers us this cleansing. He offers us this renewal where we don't have to be people enslaved in sin. It doesn't matter what our background is. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. We can be cleansed of all of our sin and be given a new life in Christ. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to see, and let me be honest, it is a beautiful thing to experience. And that is exactly what David is crying out for. David feels the burden of his guilt. David had fallen deep into sin, and he is desperate. In reading these words, you could almost see, almost picture David crying out, with tears streaming down his face in a desperate plea for God to move again in his life. There are three things that I want you to see in this text. The first thing, if we're going to experience this revival of our lives, if we're going to have what David had here, then we need to be renewed in truth. Look what David says. He says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in my inward being, and you teach me wisdom and the secret heart. David felt the taint of sin. He felt it. He knew that he had sin deep in his bones. He felt this sin burden. He understood that this wasn't just something in actions that he did, but this was at his very root. And the core of his being was corrupt. He understood, as Paul did, that he has inherited sin in Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Every one of us is born in sin. From birth, there is a taint on you that you have inherited from your great-great-great-grandparents, Adam and Eve. And ultimately, 
we can't do enough to make up for the sin that we commit because of that corruption. You see, we act upon that corruption. And I believe that babies and small children are exempt from the accountability of that sin. It doesn't mean that they're not corrupt. I'll tell you, anybody that's worked in a nursery, Bambi, Johnny, those of you who work in a nursery, volunteer basis, you don't have to teach a kid to sin. It's something that comes naturally. We are by nature sinners. We act upon the corruption. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We're going to have to give an account for the sin that we've committed, the things that we have done in sin, in rebellion against God. And David felt that burden. He knew that he was a sinner. He knew that he had messed up. He knew that he had sinned against a holy God. You see, he did not try to hide it anymore. At first he did. When he sinned with Bathsheba and he murdered her husband, he tried to hide what he had done. But at this point, he comes to a place in which he is willing to be truthful. There is no hiding in David's heart. There is no hiding what he has done. He understands that he is a sinner. And the problem is, too often, we don't want to acknowledge that we're a sinner. Whether we're in Christ or not. Christians are some of the biggest people to try to pretend like we've got all our stuff together and we don't come up short. In essence, we become just like the Pharisees at times, pretending to be something that we're not, pretending to be someone who genuinely follows Jesus, genuinely serves God, and in truth, we're not. The Pharisees confessed to love God, and they had all these things that they did for God, but yet when God sent his son, they rejected him. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 23. In verse 25, he says this, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are all full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Those are pretty biting words. You know, the thing about Jesus is, if you look in the, all his interactions in the Gospels, you'll see that his most severe of criticism was not to those who were acknowledged sinners. You know, the woman who was caught in adultery and they were trying to get him to say yes to her. Or the man who came to him and he was full of all kinds of demons. He didn't rebuke the person, did he? He called them to make a change or he healed them or called out the demons or showed grace and healing. But the people that he was the most condemning of weren't the ones who were needing forgiveness and confess that. He was condemning to those who were Pharisees who felt that they had their own righteousness, who felt that they had all their stuff together, they were following the rules, they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, they weren't doing any of the stuff that they weren't supposed to be doing, they were good people. Thus they covered up their sin pretended to be one who sought to serve and honor God, but in essence, they were serving themselves and full of self-righteousness. He condemned them because they were, as he says, whitewashed tombs. Something that looks good on the outside. A tomb that held bones but was pretty on the outside and looked clean, but inside there was a rotting corpse. 
a perfect illustration and example for what happens when we start to pretend to be somebody that we're not, just as David did. No, God wants us to have truth. He says, behold, in verse 6 of Psalm 51, behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. That truth that we need is the truth about who we really are. Not to lie about how good we are and how we serve God and how we come to church and how we are active in ministry and how we do all the things that we're supposed to be doing. Saying, look at me, I'm a good Christian. Look at me, I'm someone who's following Christ. But on the inside, there is a war. There is a battle. There is an inconsistency and a compromise in our life and in our hearts that we're not seeking to pursue Christ. But in our heart, we're seeking to fulfill all the desires or the pleasures or pride or all the indulgences that if we're not acting upon them, perhaps we are still pining after them desiring them with our hearts instead of desiring Christ. Jesus shared a parable in Luke 18 in which he talks about one who was full of good deeds and one who was a wicked sinner. He says this parable in verse 9 of Luke 18. He told them a parable to some who were trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt two men went up into the temple to pray one a pharisee and the other a tax collector the pharisee standing by himself prayed thus god i thank you that i am not like other men extortioners unjust adulterers or even like this tax collector i fast twice a week i give tithes of all that i get but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, David had been exalting himself and covering up his sin. But truth of who he was and how he had failed and what he had done was ever before him, and he confessed it, and he didn't want to hide his sin anymore. If we're going to experience revival and renewal, it means that we must be honest to God about who we really are, not on the exterior but on the interior. We must allow his gaze to look deep within our hearts and our lives and expose the things that we treasure more than him. The second thing that I want you to see, not only do we need to have renewed truth, but we need to have renewed cleansing by the Spirit. Look what it says there in verse 7. It says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. David here asks for cleansing. He desperately wants this taint to be taken off of him. He says, purge me with hyssop. Hyssop was a bush that was regularly used for ritual cleansing. And we see it in Leviticus 14, where it's being used to cleanse a leper. You see, David did not simply think that his cleansing was exterior, simply in the actions that he did but that spiritually on the inside he needed to be cleansed. He knew that this wasn't just something that could be washed off or something that could just be changed just by him changing his actions, which is sometimes what we buy into, isn't it? We think, God, I know I've messed up. I know that I have, I have done something wrong, but I tell you what, I'm going to do better. I'm going to change my ways, God, and I'm going to start to do the things that you know, that I know you want me to do. I'm going to start coming to church. I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to start praying. I may even see Brother Eddie and ask if he needs some help with the youth. But I'm not really going to ask for God to cleanse me deep within. I don't want to open that up. I don't want to be broken over my sin. 
when in reality we need it to be exposed. We need to be willing to let God look deep in our hearts and expose the things that we've done because it's hard, nay, impossible to repent from something you're not willing to confess. How can you turn away from and kill something in your life that you're not really, really willing to look at? If you have something in your life that you know you struggle with, the answer isn't to cover it up. The answer is to allow God to help you turn away from it. The answer is for you to maybe even get help from some of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Some accountability. Or perhaps something even more radical than that. Perhaps there's something that you need really serious help, like an addiction problem. Perhaps there's something going on in your life that you're going to need a lot of help from, and yet you've been just trying to cover it up or try to ignore it and just say, God, I'll just change what I'm doing. I'll just try harder. I'll just do more things for you. When in reality, we need to be broken over it so that God could heal us. Now, if you know anything about David, you know that he was a shepherd boy when he was called to be king. And the imagery here in this broken, this broken um, bone in verse 8, let me hear joy and gladness, let the bones that you have broken rejoice. The imagery here comes from that of a shepherd. That quite often if there was a sheep, perhaps a lamb who would continually wander away from the flock, one that would go off on his own, maybe just had a, had a desire to go explore, or perhaps just one that wasn't quite as focused to follow the other sheep. There was great danger in that lamb or in that sheep to be killed by a wolf or someone who would want to devour it. Well, a shepherd who loves a sheep would sometimes break the leg of the sheep so that that sheep, so that that lamb couldn't wander off any longer and frequently would actually take and carry that sheep keeping it close to the shepherd during the healing process so that as that sheep learned to depend upon the shepherd would no longer want to go astray even after it was healed because of the bond that exists between the sheep and the shepherd. In the same way, sometimes God has to expose those ugly things in our hearts and in our lives so that we can be broken. Sometimes this comes through discipline, which is painful, but yet is very productive in our life. Perhaps that's what we can see is happening here in David's life as we see in the New Testament. In Hebrews chapter 12, the author of Hebrews writes about it extensively, explaining to us how it is that God sometimes breaks our bones so that we can be healed and so that we'll be more dependent upon our great shepherd. In Hebrews 12, verse 7, it says, It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Since we not much more have be subject to the, spirit, the father of spirits and live... For they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. You see, God sometimes has to break us a little so that we will get our attention back on him. David experienced the brokenness of his sin. And he experienced negative consequences because of it. But yet he says that he wants those broken bones to rejoice. How can it possibly be that we are in sin? God breaks a bone. He disciplines us. He wounds us in some way to get us back to him. And yet now we can rejoice in that brokenness. How can we possibly rejoice in brokenness? Well, you see, once we're back with him, once we are back close, in a renewed right fellowship with him. That brokenness. That bone that he had to, broke, to break. Or that difficulty he 
had us to go through so that we'd be focused back on him. Now we look back and even though it was painful, we rejoice that he did it. And that he did not allow us to continue to go astray. It is the grace of God that causes him to discipline us. It is his grace in which he pursues us even when we disobey him. It was God's grace that pursued David here. God could have just treated him like any other king who was disobedient. But he gives him an opportunity. He gives him an opportunity to repent and he does do a mighty work in him, reestablishing him. God offers us the same grace. And looking back on those difficulties, we can look back and rejoice that God gave us grace and did not allow us to continue to wander away. In Hebrews 12, 11, it says, For the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. If you've ever experienced any kind of discipline, you probably didn't like it. The other day, I had to give little Jason a spanking. And Eddie, unfortunately, I hope he didn't hear, but it was while we were in the office. I had to take him into another room. And I had to give him a spanking. Yes, I do spank. I do believe that sometimes you have to spank. I am, I am not ashamed by that. I do not hurt my child to beyond what I need to, but sometimes you need to get his attention. And I'm thankful that my God spanks me sometimes. That he loves me enough sometimes to harm me a little bit so that I can be trained. That's exactly what God did in David's life. And we need not be afraid of God doing that in our life. Sometimes we're so terrified to expose those things that we're really struggling with in our hearts because we don't want to be spanked. We don't want to look at it. We don't want it to be exposed. We know it's going to be painful. But as long as we run away... We'll never be healed from it. And we'll never be close to Christ like we ought to be. Sometimes we just need to come to our daddy and just say, God, I've messed up. Go ahead and spank me. Go ahead and do whatever you need to do so that I can be back with you again. Thank him for his desire to discipline us his love that pursues us, his unconditional love that does not throw us away when we mess up. The third thing I want you to see in the text is that not only do we need to have renewed truth, renewed cleansing, but also renewed purity. Look what he says there in verses 9 through 12. It says, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. There are four requests that David makes for purity in this text. He requests God to forget his sin. He says, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. He asked for God to do what he said he would do in Jeremiah 31. That he would put us far from the guilt of our sin. He asked for God to restore a new heart and a right spirit. He says, hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Jesus talked about a new heart when he shared the parable of the soils in which he gave four different responses to God in his word. He said that there was a hard heart that the word of God could not penetrate. He said that there was a shallow heart in which there was no, very little dirt and the roots couldn't grow. He said that there was a thorny heart in which there was lots of weeds and it would choke out the word. And then he said that there was this Good soil, this good heart that will take in the word of God and will respond with obedience, love, and faith. That's what David asked for here. He says, create in me a heart that yearns for you again, God. Create in me a heart that desires to know you and to live for you, God. 
Create in me this heart that no longer pines after sin, no longer desires to leave you, but help me in my brokenness to cling to you. We can't do that for ourselves. You can't just decide, I'm going to have a clean heart. So I'm going to now will myself into having this purity of heart. I just wish it was that easy, but it's not. This is something that only happens when we come to God and he cleans it. He cleanses it when we come to know him. But then sometimes he needs to cleanse it day after day after day. As sin bubbles up to the surface, as desires or actions of sin are born in our life he has to continue to clean it out and it's okay that's the way it's supposed to happen if god is is burdening you convicting you of something in your life don't run away from it don't look away allow him to expose it so that he can remove it so that your heart can be pure again it's something that he wants to do It's something that only he can do. Thirdly, he gives us the request for restored presence. He says, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. It's one of the first things that we feel when we dabble in sin. At first, we won't realize it. At first, we may think, well, nothing's changed. I've stuck my toe in sin and the temperature's the same. Nothing's really changed. We look around and no lightning bolt came down. I've still got a pulse. I'm still alive. So everything must be okay. Nothing's changed. That means I can go ahead and sin and it'll be all right. The truth is that as soon as we choose sin over the Savior, our heart starts to get cold And we no longer sense the presence in our life of the Holy Spirit. Not that he has abandoned us or that he has left us, but that we, by our willful choice to disobey God, has stuffed sinful cotton in our ears so that we cannot feel his presence in our life anymore. David says, please don't take your spirit from me. He probably didn't realize that that hardness of heart had begun and that he didn't sense the leading of the Holy Spirit. He probably had gone quite a while and not realized the absence of the Holy Spirit. But once it came to him and he realized, wait a second, I don't feel God's presence in my life. Wait a second, I I was getting used to what that felt like to not have God's Spirit in my life. I got used to it. And the problem is, is that so often we get used to it. We think it's supposed to be like this. When we pray and we don't really feel any different, we think that's the way it's supposed to be. That's just the way Christian life is. When we go about our day and we don't feel His presence leading us to share our faith or leading us to go help someone or to have some encouraging words, when we realize that there's a scowl on our face rather than a joyful smile, we don't realize that the problem is that we've hardened our hearts Dulled our ears to the Holy Spirit in our life. We think that this is the way it's supposed to be. So we continue on. When in reality we're missing out on so much that God wants to do in our life. To use us. But as we sin. As we sin either by action or by apathy. By omission or commission. As we sin our heart grows colder and colder. Our ears go duller and duller to where we can barely hear anything at all. That's why God sent Nathan the prophet to David. Sometimes he has to send someone to us. Perhaps it's just us allowing our hearts to be tender enough to hear. And he'll scream at us and say, you know you need to get right. You know you need to change this. You know it does not honor me. It's why we run from him in prayer. It's why we don't really worship him. It's why we don't read the scriptures. It's why we don't open up our ears because we know that he's going to convict. We know that he's going to tell us what we ought to do, what we ought to change, and we're running from it. But when we respond, then the presence of the Spirit renews us, and we can have the fourth thing that he mentions, which is 
renewed and restored joy. He says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. You see, David had a joyless faith. In the moments in which he was convicted and felt that separation and that burden, he felt a joyless faith. Have you ever been there? Be honest. Don't lie. Doesn't matter if you lie to me or not, but you need to be honest for him. Have you ever had a joyless faith in which maybe you did what you ought to do, but there was no joy in it? You read the scriptures, you prayed, you came to church and worshiped, but there was no joy in it. We're not supposed to have a joyless faith. We're supposed to be filled, as Peter says, with joy inexpressible. Even though we go through difficulties and trials, we're supposed to have joy in Christ that can never be taken away from us except that we allow sin to rob us of the joy that we have in Christ. It's the only thing that can take joy away. Persecution can't. Somebody treating you badly can't. Your name being shamed can't, but you dabble in sin. You will allow your heart to wander away from God, and you'll have no joy in Christ. David desperately wanted his joy back, and he was so joyful in his psalms. As he praises God, even though he run for his life, even from his son. He has such great joy, but in these moments, there is no joy, there is only pain. What we need to do is be willing to go through the pain so that we can have renewed joy, so that we can be cleansed, so that we can be purged, so that our hearts have been exposed, so that we can have this renewed truth, this renewed cleansing, and this renewed purity so that our joy can be renewed in him. The truth is, is that we're really, really good at hiding who we really are sometimes. And in the evangelical church, too often, what we do as brothers and sisters in Christ as we attend church is we put up a fake facade. And in that facade, it looks like we're okay. It looks like I'm doing fine serving Christ. It looks like I'm doing fine in my life. But on the inside, we are languishing because we are not pure before God. We desperately need our sin to be exposed, even though we try to hide it. We desperately need our heart to be renewed. We desperately need God to work in us and expose the things that we need to confess and to expose the things that we're not doing that he's calling us to do. We desperately need this even though it is painful. But let me tell you, there's nothing more satisfying than living for Christ. There's nothing more joyful than being in the center of his will. But sadly, there is nothing more painful than running from God. And as brothers and sisters of Christ, so often we don't tell others. We don't tell the ones that are closest to us, and we don't even want to admit it to ourselves that we are absolutely dying on the inside even though we know Jesus. Perhaps that's where some of us are at. Perhaps there are things in your life that you know you need to make right. There are things in your life that you know you need to change. Perhaps it's just that you need to resurrender your life into his hands so that you can be renewed again. Would you please stand?